6 a.m. in the deserts of Jordan. A final preparations for one of the most dangerous aeronautical feats ever attempted. The mission has brought together two world-class pilots with a shared passion for pushing the limits. Their plan is to launch a hang glider eight miles above the Earth. If the plan works, a 34-year-old British woman will fulfill her ambition to break the world hang gliding altitude record. If it fails, the results could be fatal. It's certainly the most technically difficult challenge I've ever faced. It's way beyond anything I've done before. The other things that I've done have been often physically challenging and mentally very challenging. But they've all been much more within my sphere of experience. This one is way outside it. Mr. Ben, radio check. A balloon is the only aircraft with the altitude capability to launch a hang glider at the edge of space. To do it, the glider and its pilot must hang beneath the basket on a cord. At a given command, the cord will be cut. Okay, tighten the lines. Take up the slack. The project demands state-of-the-art aviation science and technology. On the final high-altitude drop, the temperature could touch 70 degrees below freezing. If the oxygen system fails, the pilots will die in just 30 seconds. Chase uh, Kapoor, we have you visual. Um, the, uh, no one even knows if it's possible to fly a hang glider in air so thin. Dropping hang gliders from balloons is an inherently dangerous operation. Even today's test drop at a mere 6,000 feet holds serious risks. Ready to Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. At the age of 19, Judy Ledden flew her first hang glider, just 35 kilograms of aluminium and Dacron fabric, the nearest a human being can get to flying like a bird. In the years that followed, she won two world championships and became the first woman to fly a hang glider across the English Channel. Now age 34, at the peak of her flying career, Judy has set her sights on her most dangerous challenge yet. Yes, this project is going to be dangerous and there are risks involved. But the goal gets such a grip on me that I can't let it go until I've done it. I love to have a challenge and I love to push hard at the limits. And to do that, the risk is necessary and you have to weigh up the risk against the achievement and the thrill and to me it's worth it judy's flying partner is the balloon pilot pear lindstrand holder of all three absolute records for hot air ballooning and richard branson's partner on the record-breaking atlantic and pacific flights it is absolutely nothing safe about going to 40,000 feet and dropping the hang glider. Uh, whereas I'm in the basket, I can move around. An oxygen problem is cured by attacking whatever component. She's strapped in the glider. She has limited move, ability to move. Uh, accessibility is bad. Her only connection with me is the string. She can't climb up the string, anything goes wrong. Uh, the glider tumbles. Uh, she will have great difficulty getting out of it. Uh, I can't think of any aspect of the entire flight that is in any way safe. Lindstrand's balloon will lift Judy to a target of 42,000 feet, 7,000 feet above the existing record. At the maximum altitude, they will be 9,000 feet higher than a passenger jet and 13,000 feet higher than the summit of Everest. Judy and Pear have worked together for four years in their quest for the altitude record. It's Pear Lindstrand from England. I don't think we talked for the last 
As an aviation engineer and inventor, Pear has an encyclopedic knowledge of high altitude flight and how to survive it. Liability problems, lawyers, insurance, etc. It's a project where we are taking the risks. Six months before the attempt is due to take place, Judy arrives at Lindstrand's balloon factory in Shropshire to discuss some of the problems in store. Members of Lindstrand's technical design team will attend the meeting. Good morning. Hi. Hi, Simon. I want to talk to you about this new drop angle that we've worked out. The problem is, as far as the glider's concerned, if I start in a horizontal position, as I usually do, the glider will fall into vertical, and it will not start to fly until there's enough air flowing over it in vertical position. So while it's dropping into vertical, there's quite a lot of rotation on the glider. And the danger is at that altitude, because the air's so thin, the glider's just going to continue to rotate, go over on its back, and then it'll break. So what I've got to do is to slow down that violent rotation. And the way I've thought of, of doing it is to hang the glider at 45 degrees. So to get to the vertical position, it's nothing like a sharper movement, because you've only got half the distance to travel before it gathered, gathers up its speed dies at the ground and starts to fly again and will then pull out. This is my theory. So in the worst case, if it did flip over, what can you do? My main aim in this whole discussion is to make sure that I don't go upside down because I think the potential consequences of going upside down are really serious. It's not like going upside down in a balloon drop at 3,000 feet where no. throwing a parachute would be a fairly straightforward operation. At that height, I'm not convinced that the parachute wouldn't blow apart. Tell me about the, uh, the oxygen equipment, because I'm a bit concerned that there's not much space on my glider for it. It's also a weight consideration, of course. You've got to take quite a bit with you. You've got two choices. Either you take two of these, or you take one large one. Are you joking? This will give you about three hours, and that'll give you about an hour and a half. You've got primary regulator, and you've got the gate Can contact gate, yes. That's about 60 kilos. Regulates on the truck. <laughs> Are you kidding? That's almost as much as the glider. Has that got oxygen in it? Oxygen just slightly heavier than air, by the way. Well, I mean, where am I going to attach this? Keel, A-frame, one on each upright A-frame, one on the keel. Uh, I mean, uh, speaking logically, this is going to really upset the sea of Jesus. Is it really possible to fly with all this equipment? This is seriously concerning me, actually. Um, I don't know until we try it out. I mean, I certainly won't even be able to lift the glider once I've got the oxygen bottles on, so I'm going to have to have it on wheels and have people help me trundle it about. Um, so I can't lift it, but as to whether or not it'll fly, we'll just have to try it and Why see. Why do you never lift it? You'll be carried all the time. Do you have a, 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 some sort of emergency set in case this goes wrong? No. This the works as it is. There is another problem. At extreme altitude, the human body can't survive unaided. There is only one third of the air at sea level, and there is insufficient pressure to enable the lungs to function. A space suit could be the solution. Pear has one, second hand from the Russian space program. You've got to dive behind and get the helmet in at the same time you stick your arms in. So, arms first, okay. halfway through. And then you have to dive back, okay? Oh, what, an, what an attractive bit of kit. Okay, now you're in it. Right. Arms, okay? Yep. Right, now I'm going to seal the suit, okay? It's quite primitive. You seal it merely by gathering the fabric together and turning it back like this. I must say, it makes me feel like I want to go hang gliding in it. They deliberately select astronaut to be quite small because it um, saves a lot of spacecraft sizes. Oh. <laughs> it's not built for comfort, is it? Exactly. It's only built for survival. Okay. Would you like a hand? Okay, hand please. <laughs> Right, I'm going to close it up now. For about five right, seconds, you'll be, you'll be out of oxygen. Right. So you're going to fog up a little bit. So don't panic. Okay. 
it for yourself. <laughs> yeah, okay, try move your arms up now. Pretend you're in the glider. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Give me a hug, give me a hug. <laughs> I did not for that one. I think I can safely say absolutely no way at all. <laughs> it is struggle. And I only had you half the pressure you would have in space. Oh, you can't do anything. There was half. You just sit there. Hmm. And now Mr. Blobby feels. Just the same. The space suit is not a viable option. It's up to Pear to sort out a workable alternative. Oh, dear. So you fancy a bit of fishing, do you, Pear? The following month, Pear flies Judy to Sweden. The destination is the Swedish Air Force Base at Linköping. He's got very useful contacts. Pear knows people in high places and useful places. The Swedish Air Force respect Pear's achievements and he's very thick with them and for that reason we can get hold of the oxygen equipment that we need. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The FFV Aerotech facility is regarded as one of Europe's most sophisticated aviation research and development centers. In return for equipment and backup, Pear and Judy will report back on how their systems perform outside a fighter cockpit. At the end of the day, we're testing their kit. Their kit's been tested down to minus 30. We're going to take it to minus 65 and below. Judy's first appointment is to have her helmet fitted. And then we have to check if the helmet is fitting like a glow that ah. I told you before. Okay. Okay. So I start with this. Very, <coughs> Very nice. <laughs> this is not a helmet. Oh, right. Ah. We have a bit more protection, do we? Yeah. Measure a little here. Okay. Helmet here. So, what sort of foam is this that you're It's a foam. On? It's a very good foam for to take up a shock if you have a crash. Right. Yeah, this okay. is the bit that makes me nervous. Oh, you should not be nervous. You're not nervous, <laughs> I'm not nervous. You must trust on me. Okay. Can you hold this, please? Look up, please. Next, her mask is adjusted so that it's completely airtight. Down, please. Then the oxygen supply is connected. Above 38,000 feet, the lungs can't function normally. They must be force-fed oxygen under pressure. Normally, inhalation is an active process where you have to actually make some effort to get the air into your lungs. But with this system, as soon as you relax, the air fills your lungs. And then it's actually an active process to get the air out. So. It's a great effort to exhale, and that's unusual because usually you're used to just relaxing and the air comes out. So all the muscles that you normally use for breathing, you actually reverse them. Okay, go ahead, breathe. It just feels as though somebody's hands in front of your face, and it's just sort of stopping you brooding, and you're having to literally push it away. You're actually having to exhale past this invisible hand in front of you, so it's actually quite hard to get the air out. Yeah, as soon as you relax, it seems to just flood into your lungs. When it's at lower pressure, it feels almost like diving when you're under the water and you're just aware of breathing being a bit different. But as soon as the pressure goes up a bit, it definitely feels odd. Not very pleasant, really. But, I mean, if it keeps you alive, then it's worth it. So I'm really pleased having done it. And it makes me a lot more confident going into the pressure chamber, knowing that pressure breathing, you know, knowing what it feels like, I suppose. Yeah, this is the um, business end of the chamber. The, um, the three seats there, where we're doing the test, and this is where the, um, the doctor... The pressure chamber session has two objectives. It will teach Judy and Pear to recognize the symptoms of altitude sickness 
and enable medics to run tests to ensure they're fit for the project. They put on their pressure suits for the first time. These are light, flexible units which, when inflated, keep the vital organs from expanding to the point where they fail. Are we supposed to put the, put the foot in the back here? Of course. Is this right? Have we got to do the sit ups first? Yeah, I think. Uh, in order to do this, you've got okay. to Can you loosen up the back? Well, you've got all the slack there is in here, Beth. I think it's um, cornflakes and water for the next two weeks. Rama, I'm losing battle here. Okay, how's that? You look lovely. <laughs> you look like a grand piece yourself, lovely. <laughs> Where are the helmets? Oh, a Swedish Air Force doctor will supervise the session. There is the danger of the pilots blacking out. I think we're with the chamber go up to 3,000, as we discussed. The chamber is activated and the air pumped out. You can put on your mask now. At a simulated altitude of 30,000 feet, the two pilots will remove their masks. The lack of oxygen will rapidly affect their brains, bringing on hypoxia, acute oxygen starvation. Judy starts a simple subtraction exercise but falters as oxygen starvation hits her brain. Pear, meanwhile, starts to have more serious problems. His helmet is too tight and he can't equalize the pressure in his inner ear. A slight cold makes it worse. Lindstrand's pulse rate, seen top right, races up to 100 beats a minute as the pain strikes. By the end of the session, Lindstrand is in acute discomfort. Pressurizing on my ears. Here, just where you want to swallow, you know, it's preventing me from going. It's too tiny, it doesn't have the helmet. Oh. Back in England, Judy goes through her own painful trial, this time at the dentist. Because of the difference in pressure at the target altitude, a single microscopic bubble trapped inside an old filling could expand and explode the tooth. In five long sessions, every one of Judy's fillings is drilled out and carefully replaced. Next on the agenda is the choice of location for the final drop. The attempt calls for blue skies and light winds. Jordan is a perfect location, particularly as King Hussein himself an aviation enthusiast, has pledged support. Because from my experience, the skies are always clear and the winds are always light. And it's only real disadvantage is the fact that it's bordered on several sides by countries that aren't particularly friendly. I don't really know what might happen if we go into Baghdad, into Baghdad airspace, into Iraq. And I know that there's certainly quite a lot of ground to wear missiles in the Syrian area and presumably it'll be the same, if not worse, in Iraq. There has to be some form of high-level liaison. Can we do that through King Hussein? Right. King Hussein will give us somebody to liaise with, and, and he himself might, might personally tell the Saudis what we're doing. And the Iraqis? And to give them warning. Well, I expect the same will happen. I mean, as a courtesy, we, we need to tell them, mm. just in case, so that when we, you know, if we land here in Iraq, 
um, they, they know who we are. Okay, that's the one. All right, ready, and go. Wow. Oh, that looks brilliant there. Not bad, not bad. That looks huge in here. At a disused shipyard in Liverpool, Judy and Pear plan to test a specially designed feature, a pulley system built onto the hang glider. Pear, can you take me up, please? OK, go up. OK. OK. OK, tighten the lines. OK, high is the glider above the ground. Try the, uh, the pulley system. Judy is convinced that the 45 degree position, nose down, will be safest for the drop. Is that 45 degrees? It's a hell of a strain on my arm. I think I'm going to have to hold the bar with my knees. Hey, that's got to be 45. Yeah, the boy, I'll give you 40, 42, 44.5 on that. All I can see is your ass down there. What's that? I said, all I can see is your ass. <laughs> it's all you're going to see, mate. It's a pair of feet. There is one final test session before leaving for Jordan. Judy and her team arrive at the Bristol Balloon Fiesta, an annual event where more than 60 balloons take to the skies. Judy isn't here for a pleasure flight. Her plan today is to try out the drop system for real. Well, my main objective today is to test the new release system, the 45 degrees nose down. And it's also the first drop for this glider, which is always a little bit more nerve-wracking than normal because, you know, I've not done it before. Once a glider's pulled out the dive and you know it's going to do it, it's fine. So, a little tense, but I'm looking forward to it, really, because I, I want to get started on the testing. Can you give me a radio check, Pear? One, two, three, decimal four, five. Hang on, stand by. There it goes, man. Off the ground, hit it. Okay. Hit it, man. At 4,000 feet, she will face her moment of truth. Okay, descending 500 feet, Judy. I just want you to understand another 100. Just check that the rope is twisted, Pear. Judy, you are twisted. Rose, tense clockwise, please. I can't do anything about it. Are you able to free it, Judy? Over. Negative, it's on the back of the keel. After 10 minutes in the air, Judy is ready to go. She pulls herself to the drop position, nose down at 45 degrees. OK, stand by then for uh, release. Yeah, I'll give you a count, down to five. Judy, um, from the ground here, that looked like a very clean drop. Over. Yeah, it was fine. I'm busy at the moment, so I'm fully back. OK, you do your stuff and we'll see you later. Seen from the helicopter, the drop is a complete success. Judy falls just a short distance before pulling out of the dive.
Mid-October, the project members arrive in Jordan. <laughs> Judy and Pear have 11 team members with them, all volunteers. Their first mission is to track down the £80,000 worth of equipment and clear it through customs. This, this, this here is one piece. Yeah. All in here. All in here. Should be. Oh. Then, we, then we've got 12 separate boxes, I believe. OK, no problem. I believe. And then the hand dryers. There you go. What's happening in the world, huh? Um, the, crime in the, the balloon team leaves next day for the deserts of South Jordan. A desert launch site has many advantages, not least the number of possible places to land. The journey takes them south from Amman on the 300-kilometer trip to Wadi Rum the location for the classic film, Lawrence of Arabia. Judy and the rest of the team are flown down in a helicopter of the Royal Squadron. With her is partner Chris Dawes, an experienced hang glider pilot. He will assist in preparing the oxygen systems for the attempt. The Jordanian army have built a tented camp in the wadi, home for the next two weeks. OK, we'll just put it outside, maybe if we can. That'll be great, just there. We were great, we got lost. On the way to Jaffa, we got lost, and we stopped at another police station and they invited us in for coffee. <laughs> looking, for, looking for another police station. Looking for another police station and then we arrived at Al Jaffa and uh, we had lunch there. We were looked after really well and we came here. Very welcome. This is wonderful. Mm. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you like it. Yeah, it's absolutely and you've incredible. Got, you've put the tent behind the hill so it's quiet. Yeah, it's yeah. quiet. Mm. And they live there. There is a car over there. That's we uh, could see use. Any you mean by seven kilometers? Yeah, I yeah. think. Uh, yeah. Are we just going to have to wear some kind of swimming sweaters? All out! Judy's first test flight at Wadi Rum. Towed behind a microlight, she will ascend to 5,000 feet above the desert floor and cut free. Can you slow down a bit? That's good. I was on the front of the bar, pulled right in the whole time before. The purpose of the flight is to try out the special wheels she needs for the record attempt. A normal landing on foot would be impossible with a huge oxygen cylinder strapped to her back. Getting a bit rough up here, Ben. I'm releasing now. Uh, OK, June. We'll see you back at the rest now. Have a good flight. This has to be the most beautiful place on Earth. Oh, God. That's a really good one. Oh, dear. It's quite disconcerting the first time because your, your face is really low to the ground and you're used to standing upright so you're a good sort of five feet or six feet above the ground as you're coming in. And it's really quite different to be, to have your face a foot above the ground. You get quite, quite a lot of ground rush. But uh, it really works a treat. He's got a camel under I met her in Brazil and uh, 
she actually walked into the breakfast room and it was before a competition and she looked over at me and said uh, are you Chris and I said why do you do I owe you money <laughs> that was basically it the only thing that's really going to kill her is the oxygen supply and that's why I'm spending so much time going over it now that or something structural with the balloon then she has to release and get out before that balloon hits her they're using hydrogen at altitude we all know hydrogen and oxygen when mixed together it can be very explosive to say the least Stop breathing. Okay, breathe. i woke up a few nights ago having a bit of a nightmare that uh, i was suffocating that my oxygen mask had for some reason become blocked probably frozen and uh, i couldn't breathe basically and uh, i woke up and straight away I started thinking about that because it is a realistic problem that, that the exhaust valve on the oxygen mask becomes frozen. The sub-zero temperatures at high altitude pose a serious threat. With her assistant Miranda, Judy rehearses her dressing routine. At 70 degrees below freezing, hypothermia and frostbite are real dangers. On the final day, she will have to wear 18 separate layers of protective gear. The balloon team also has work to do. Pear joins balloon crew chief David Jenkins to inflate the envelope for the first time and check there are no unforeseen problems. A safe distance away, Project organizer Jules Wigdor begins the hazardous transfer of propane gas into the tanks which will travel with the balloon. Believe it or not, this, um, that junction is stuck. That what? Well, it won't swivel on itself, so I have to tie the hose up and not simply to get it on. There are a number of special problems associated with fuel at high altitude. Not least the difficulty of relighting the burner if it should go out. Very few things will ignite propane at uh, 15,000 feet. This is a wand which will do exactly that. It consists of a battery and an ignition unit. This, in fact, this one sits in the Rolls Royce RB211 jet engine. This particular spark plug is what starts a jet engine. So this one fires up a 20 ton engine. And all I have to do is stick it up in the flame, press the button. In fact, if I point. If I press that to your heart and, and run it, it'll probably be a heart attack. I know she's worried about the flight. Um, she'd be a fool if she wasn't. Um, there are risks, and uh, she has to calculate those risks as much as possible. But uh, she has not fooled herself into believing that what she's about to do is easy or that it can be done and we're away next week. In case anything goes wrong, go for the glider. Let's see, for example, if I get unconscious, the balloon will come down nice and gently and even land and it wouldn't even hurt me because the balloon will slow down to about a thousand feet a minute and will land, even if I do nothing, it will come nice and gently. If anything goes wrong and you have to make a decision, go for the glider. The last few moments will be absolutely horrendous. For a start, the discomfort will be extraordinary. I will have been, ha I will have had the mask on for a, the minimum time will have been three and a half hours. So that will be incredibly uncomfortable. I'll be very, very cold, but the worst thing of all will be that we'll have started pressure breathing, which is incredibly uncomfortable and very abnormal and feels awful. Not only that, but I'll be worried about the glider pulling out of the dive. I'll be worried that the release maybe won't work. So, uh, I won't want to be in my shoes at that particular point. If she doesn't feel apprehensive about it, uh, she's dangerous. Because the human body and brain functions best at a medium level of intensity and slight moment of anxiety, because that is when the body produces the best performance. And you need that adrenaline to survive up there. I'm sure at that point in time I'll regret not taking up chess. Everything is in place, every final detail thought out and rehearsed. Now only an adverse weather report can halt the takeoff. The magic number is 40,000 feet. What do you mean by magic number? 
Well, because that's the height we're trying to go with the blue. Mm. And his 45 plus degree correct is 260. 26040. That's not perfect. Mm. It's quite good. Mm. We go at 530. So the key points are, as Chris said, that the balloon and hang glide are fully rigged, ready for attaching to each other by 445. So everyone has, must work backwards from there. As far as the balloon team is concerned, to be up at 4.45, I want the entire balloon crew ready at 4 at the latest. I'd like you to raise your glasses. Tomorrow's a big day. Good luck. And, uh, yes, I, went to, um... and uh, <laughs> I want to uh, wish Judy and her and everyone else the best of luck tomorrow morning. Three thirty AM. No one has slept. Just do them all up a bit and then tighten them all up a little bit more. That's how tight it should be. Is there one higher up? No, there isn't. Okay, there isn't. can you just tighten up those laces then? Yeah. I want to be able to breathe, alright. Easy, easy, easy. Yeah. Just uh, skin yeah. tight. That will do, that will do, yeah. I give you five kilos. Five kilos. Speak louder. I give you five bars. The masks are fitted. The pre-breathing begins. By breathing pure oxygen, the blood is denitrogenized. If the pilot simply took off and ascended straight to 40,000 feet, bubbles of nitrogen would develop in the bloodstream and cause the bends. By the end of the flight, they would be dead from nitrogen narcosis. So for the next two hours, they will do nothing but breathe pure oxygen. The recording barograph is sealed with wax in preparation for the flight. This is a calibrated instrument placed in the balloon basket to verify the exact height of the drop.